muted. Uh, forgot to unmute the mic. Well, welcome back to Game Over Ottawa, everybody. My name is Maud, your host as always. Uh, now that I am unmuted, I am here to react to that crazy finish. I can't believe that we actually pulled off the the comeback for once. The the Sens haven't been able to score with the goalie pulled at all, all season long, and really under DJ Smith whatsoever. And then suddenly, I think it was two goals, both with the goalie pulled here today, just absolutely shocking the uh, <laughs> shocking the Calgary Flames. I'm I'm a little bit stunned here today, just trying to to break down what we just saw. Um, Everyone in chat, uh, I think my mic is working now. Let me know uh, if that's uh, if that's working just fine. I think I see my audio levels going through here, here now. Um, if if you guys could give me the the go ahead there to keep going, I think we're good. Um, but yeah, I was prepared to come on here and just totally just uh, <laughs> totally just rip into the sense, and I, I still think I'm going to be pretty critical here tonight uh, because that was not. Not a great game overall, but I can't complain. I feel like I shouldn't complain too much about a win because it was just just absolutely shocking because I think that was really, up until the comeback, that was one of the worst Sens games all year. Um, but yeah, Hamza, it was the Jimmy Stu show, wasn't it? It's funny because uh, Stutzla, a lot of people I was seeing on Twitter kind of saying it's not his best night tonight, but then he ends up getting, I think, was it four points? Anyway, I think, did he assist every goal? Yeah, he assisted every goal. Four points tonight for Tim Stutzla. He, he tops it off with the overtime winner. Just oh, what an absolute beast Stutzla is. Even when he's not having a great night, he still puts up points. And then he was able to just take the game into his own hands and OT and, and finish things off. So uh, we're going to get into that and, and much more tonight. Uh, just going to thank our sponsor, Sports Interaction, first. Think you know which way it's going to go? Make your bet with Sports Interaction. Whether it's hockey, football, or basketball, Sports Interaction has you covered. Bet pre-game, live and play, or on one of our many prop bets. Sports Interaction makes it easy to deposit, play, and cash out. Join now and see all that sports betting has to offer. Head to sportsinteraction.com sdpn. That's sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn. 19 plus, please play responsibly. I always forget to turn that off, but hey, it was a hilarious win tonight. So play the send sound effect again. We're just we're just gonna go with it. I I I've I've done that again. I managed to do that. But uh, I want to shout out PEI Senators in the chat. He said his game froze at three to one down, and then when he got it refreshed, saw Debrinket celebrating for the game time goal. Yeah, that was really quick in between those last two goals. Uh, I was actually walking down uh, into the basement here to my setup to just get get the stream ready to go like early before the game was even finished because I thought the Sens had absolutely no shot of coming back in this game. Uh, but then I just had the game going on my phone and I looked down and saw Batherson celebrating. So I'm like, oh, run back upstairs to the TV uh, instead of watching it on my little phone screen. And uh, shockingly, I was actually treated to uh, a surprise Senators comeback, which uh, again, that's been so rare for this team to actually be able to come back. I think um, I think it was Jack Richardson tweeted a stat about we've only come back from two goals down under DJ Smith something like eight times, I think it was, in four years. I think those were the numbers. I might be misremembering it slightly, but finally we got a comeback win. I, I love comeback wins come from behind. is always just so satisfying, but it's... Uh, I did not expect it here tonight, so, like, I'll go into into my notes that I had for the first two periods. I had kind of stopped writing notes in the third period because we really just weren't generating anything at all until uh, we got the goalie pulled, and I was just kind of like, oh, screw this game. I'm ready to come on here and rip the sense to shreds, but <laughs> I'm I'm just confused emotionally now because I feel like I should be celebrating, but... First things first, we got to give a huge shout out to Mad Sogar because he was just absolutely awesome tonight. Uh, I felt kind of bad for him for the majority of the game because the play was just entirely in the Sens end. I don't know what the final stats ended up being, but before uh, we started the comeback, I remember they showed the offensive zone ice time on the scoreboard, or like a ozone possession time, and the Flames were at almost 16 minutes. The Sens were at like eight and a half, so that's almost double. 
it was just like Mad Sogard was just under siege here tonight. I do think that the Flames did have a bit of a tendency to just kind of throw the puck on net a lot, but um, it was the Sens also had uh, 28 blocks. So at least despite the uh, shot discrepancy, at least uh, the defenders were doing their job to help out the goalie a little bit in terms of blocking those shots. But overall, the team's play wasn't exactly inspiring in front of a rookie goalie other than those block shots um so very glad that Sogard ended up getting the win in the end his team actually came through in the last five minutes finally to help him out a little bit because it was uh it was really just all him out there for the first three periods just keeping the score close easily could have been a 5-1 6-1 game at any point for the flames but Sogard was awesome here tonight that's Really, really satisfying to see after losing Forsberg to that tough injury. But, uh, yeah, early in the first period, I noticed that uh, Hamannick and Holden got, like, completely walked. I can't remember which Flames player it was, but he just, like, split the D. And uh, Sogard had to make, make a huge save right away. That, that was one of his first few saves in the game. So he was tested really early. And I think Hamannick and Holden is a D pairing that I really don't want to see too much of in the future i'll say that but uh some things you gotta sometimes you just gotta go with a, a a weird d pairing you know when you're missing a guy like jake sanderson who we can see how important he is to this team when we're playing without him now it's just it, it's not shocking how much worse we are without him but it's a little bit shocking like i don't know like we all know how good he is but holy crap it's just Maybe it is shocking. You know what I will say? It is shocking how bad we were without him because he he's great at getting the puck out, by far the best of any of our defenders, but I didn't think it would be that bad without him tonight. You know, Eric Branstrom in more of a uh, increased role here tonight, but it's not like he's going to play as much as Sanderson plays because they had Shabbat 27 and a half minutes and then Branstrom was the second most with 19 minutes. So that's good at least that DJ decided to give Branstrom that opportunity instead of just uh, playing Holden ahead of him and stuff like that. So at least, even though I don't really like the Holden-Hamannick pairing, they were, uh, at least they were the third pairing. I'll say that. So that's proper usage by DJ there. Um, I think putting Branstrom and Zub together was a pretty good idea in theory. I don't know how much it worked on paper, or not on paper, like in 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 reality. Uh, I felt like the decor as a whole just had a horrible time of getting the puck out of their zone tonight. The whole first six minutes of the game, they were completely stuck in their D zone. It would just be like 40 to 50 seconds of Calgary pressure. And then we dump it out and then all the forward lines have to change because they're, they're just gassed from skating around with like chickens with their heads cut off. And then... We did score first, which was actually very shocking against the run of play. Um, Brady kind of cherry picking, I thought. I don't know why the hell he was so wide open for that breakaway pass, but good on Stutzla to spot him so quickly and just made an amazing stretch pass. And Brady is really improving at beating goalies cleanly with his shot. I, I love seeing that from him because when he was a rookie and in his sophomore year as well, he was just... He, he didn't beat goalies cleanly too often. I feel like he was always scoring those greasy, dirty goals. And I feel like we actually see him score a lot more nice goals now. So I love that. Um, we got a power play soon after that. It was terrible. And our both our first two power plays today, I believe it was... Uh, they were both negated by penalties of our own. It was, it was just a huge struggle for the Sens power play early on. They didn't really get anything going until I think it was like the fourth power play in the second period. Um, and then the Flames had some power plays of their own. I think refing was a huge discussion tonight on Twitter. I don't... Uh, I'm not going to get too much into it because I feel like there were soft calls both ways. Um, I remember seeing a pretty soft hooking call on Giroux, but then later in that same period, there was a really soft hooking call, I think, on Mangiapani. So it was, it was kind of going both ways tonight. Let me see the actual power play chances. Yeah, both teams ended up with four power play chances in the box score. So even though I think some of the calls were a little bit off tonight, at least it was even. I don't think I can complain too much. Um, 
Adam Firebear in the chat saying, not to take anyone anything away from the come from behind a win, but how many times this year has Calgary melted down with the lead? <laughs> I didn't know that was a trend for them. Um, I'm feeling feeling pretty bad for Audi right now, our game, one of our Game Over Calgary hosts. He was saying that he's got a poor record when he hosts games, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, it was looking good for him for 55 minutes of this game, but it was just not to be tonight. I might have to tune into his stream, the rerun after, and uh, see how he's feeling, check in on him, because this is definitely a tough loss for the Flames. Uh, fighting for a wild card spot, you can't be giving up points like that. Like One thing, though, that is interesting, I think my dad pointed this out to me earlier, earlier today, is that the Flames, before this game, the Flames only had one more win. Than the Sens, but it's just they had seven more OT losses that makes up that gap, which I really hate when I see stuff like that in the standings, especially because we had that seven game losing streak early in the year where it was all losses by like one goal and we couldn't score to save our lives with the goalie pulled. I feel like if we had like five more loser points, we would still be in the playoff race, at least kind of. And now after today's result, it ends up being the Sens and the Flames with the same number of wins, but the Flames picking up another overtime uh, loss. They, they're eight. They have eight more overtime loss points than the Sens. Obviously, different conferences and stuff, so it might be uh, a little easier to get in, into the playoffs in the West, but those loser points really help you out, and the Sens just haven't really been able to get any of those all year, so it was very nice, very satisfying to actually see them get to overtime when coming from behind today. It was just absolutely awesome. Oh, <laughs> Audi had a paper bag on his head to start the stream. I think I think I saw him do that earlier in the season too. So the paper bag is back. Oh, that that's rough. So I guess that gives me a bit of an idea of, of the vibes over there on, on Game Over Calgary. So <laughs> I'm definitely excited to check that out later. Um, Living in the mist in the chat. Hey mod, just re we just recalled Jacob Larson from Belleville. Ah, uh, that's interesting. I hadn't seen that yet. Um, now they were. I was going to talk about this later, but there was rumors on I think Saturday that there could be a Zaitsev deal in the works, and I kind of wonder if this call up could have something to do with that. Maybe, maybe Zaitsev might actually be be being moved after this game. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, because unless someone else got injured, uh, or maybe they just maybe they just want an extra body on the road. I don't know, because obviously they're going on the road for tomorrow, so maybe it's just precautionary. I don't remember what the next game is after that, if it's on the road or at home, but that is interesting. We'll have to watch and see if anything uh, takes place with that. Um, but yeah, uh, I feel like I've kind of said most of my thoughts on this game already like questionable refing but at least it was even the Sens just trapped in their own zone for most of the game chipping it out constantly horrible breakout attempts um there was the goal by Toffoli I think at the tail end of a power play Tyler Mott just like completely cleared it right to the Flames defenseman when the whole middle of the ice was wide open like in between the two point guys that was just I felt like that goal just kind of uh symbolized like in one play how the Sens were playing that game was just bad clearing attempts unable to get the puck out of their zone properly and it directly bit them for a goal there that was a uh, one play that really bothered me I uh, had to point that out and yeah after that goal it was 46 to 12 shot attempts I had written down that's just a pretty much an unacceptable margin like I know people had problems with the refings but again four power plays for each team it was just the Sens really had nothing going five on five today which is typical for them but it was even worse than normal um and we got a fact check in the chat I had mentioned uh, our record under DJ Smith when trailing after two it was uh yeah we are now nine wins 100 losses and 11 overtime losses under dj when trailing after two periods so i think i said that it was eight wins so i think i was right i think i remembered it correctly but uh i remember a couple weeks ago looking at the stat of the whole league like how many comeback teams each or how many comeback wins each team has and we were like dead last like 
There's a few teams that are pretty good who are near the bottom, which was surprising. Like Colorado only had a couple more than us, but maybe that's just because they they don't trail after two very often. <laughs> I'm thinking that was probably the reason. But yeah, we were dead last in that category. So very happy that we were able to actually pick one up tonight, pick up a comeback win. Um, yeah, on our, on our fourth power play attempt, I thought that uh, the first unit who actually came on second because they started the second unit. I thought that they actually did great on that power play, Com especially compared to the first three, because the first three power plays today were just completely awful. But the thing is, no one could finish on that power play. I couldn't believe how many uh, how many chances we missed. I think Dubrinkit missed two chances, Kachuk bobbled one, and then he had to pass it back to Shabbat. I think Stutzla bobbled one as well. That was just just a complete mess on that power play in terms of finishing, but all the build-up play was there. So I kind of thought at that point in the game that that was a little bit of positivity. It's like, oh, we're getting close. Maybe we'll actually start to generate stuff. But we didn't, like, actually get anything on that power play. And then from there, it didn't give us any momentum at all. And it was just right back to Calgary dominating. Like, the whole first seven minutes or so of the third period uh, before Dubé's second goal, just entirely in the send zone. Like, I was... Uh, I had the game on my phone moving around in the house like doing some chores and stuff and like at that point because I was like we we're just playing like crap I don't think I'm gonna miss too much and anytime I look at the phone it's just in the send zone in the send zone and I could tell from listening to the commentary that we weren't generating anything at all so again just I am stunned that this was a win for the sends I feel like it's very difficult to to analyze this if I should be like really positive or what all, all I'm going to say is I'm very happy, and uh, in terms of positivity, very happy for Mad Sogard as well, because he was just awesome in net. And, you know, I have a, a bit of a segment prepared today for kind of talking about goaltending, because Mad Sogard, he's going to have to take the reins here for a while. I think it's going to be, I think they said about 10 days or so until Talbot is ready to return. I'm kind of thinking that the Sens are going to want to bring in a stopgap goalie to at least back up Sogard, especially because there's a few back-to-backs coming up here. Obviously tomorrow, it will be interesting to see if they decide to start Mandalese. I don't think they will. I think they're going to stick with Sogard because he was really good tonight. But that is also tough for a young goalie. That was just his third NHL start. It's tough to have to go back-to-back -back so soon uh, for an inexperienced guy. So... That'll be interesting, so. But yeah, speaking of stopgap goalies, I have a bit of a graphic prepared here talking about goalies. Um, seeming like the one of the most likely candidates right now for the Sens is Spencer Martin. Uh, absolutely horrible stats this year, but the reason why I list him as the most likely candidate is because he was waived today. And as soon as he was waived, it was just everyone on Twitter being like, yeah, welcome to the Sens, Spencer Martin, because we, we pretty much just need a guy to fill in. And I think even though he has an extra year left on his contract uh, after this season, I think it's not too big of a deal if we picked him up just to, you know, play one or two games while Talbot is out. And then when Talbot comes back, you can send uh, Sogard back down because I still think he needs more reps at the AHL level. And then you just have Spencer Martin kind of riding the bench as a backup. If he plays a few games, who cares? Like if he does poorly, that's fine. Uh, it's not like we're, we have any chance at the playoffs at this point anyway, but I think Martin is a pretty likely option just because he will cost absolutely no uh, assets to acquire. Then I was also thinking about... Uh, Alex Nedeljkovic, almost butchered that name, even though I know how to say it. Um, completely struggled at the NHL level this year in nine games, and he got waived a while ago. Uh, but he's done really well at the AHL level, actually. 922 save percentage in 14 AHL games. This is a guy that I could see Dorian taking a flyer on just because he's expiring at the end of the year. So if he's absolutely terrible again, you, you can just cut bait with him. And he wouldn't cost much to acquire because when Detroit originally acquired him from Carolina, it was only a third round pick. And a lot of people thought that was really low, but his stock has dropped even farther since then. So 
I feel like you could get him for fifth or sixth or something, which which wouldn't which wouldn't be too bad. He's a bit of a uh, not a bounce back candidate, but a bit of a reclamation project. I think he's a guy that I'd like to see get another shot at the NHL level because I think he was good for Detroit early on, but he just wasn't the type of guy that could carry carry the team and make up for their defensive deficiencies. He's probably not going to do that with the Sens either, but. I think it's a it's a route that I could see Dorian going, giving up a late pick for a guy like that if he doesn't want to go with Spencer Martin because the thing with Martin is he's free on waivers but he has the worst goalie stats I've ever seen like 870 save percentage is shocking. He did have a 950 in six games played last season, which is why he won the backup job for the Canucks. And I think he started off pretty well this season, but it's just that. Uh, as soon as Demko went down and Martin had to play so many games, it just completely derailed for him. But I, even though he's free, I could see why someone wouldn't want to go with Martin. Um, then another name I was thinking of was Anthony Stolarz from the Ducks because I noticed that they have uh, Lucas Dolstal, a rookie goalie, on their roster. They're currently carrying three goalies, which a lot of teams don't like to do. And Stolarz is a, another guy who's a UFA after the season. Not the best stats this year, but obviously the Ducks are terrible. And he had way better stats last year. The, the Ducks were actually decent last year too. I remember they were in the playoff race at about the halfway mark. So this guy has proven he can be a pretty good backup. But I think the Ducks might want to move on from him. I don't think anyone's going to be taking that Gibson contract off of their hands. So and they it, since they have the three goalies on the roster right now, I'm thinking that they might want to uh, move on from Stollers at the deadline. I could see uh, maybe a playoff team going for him, though, if they need an upgrade at the backup position, like compared to all these other guys. Playoff teams are not going to be touching any of the other guys on the list. Maybe Stollers, though, he might actually have some trade value. So that be, might be more of, a, of a, a bit of a expensive option if we go for him, but he's also one that I could see maybe being an option in free agency after the season too because he wouldn't he wouldn't demand too much salary he'd be a pretty cheap option if uh, if we wanted to pair him with Forsberg for next season because the thing is as well like for most of these stop gaps I'm talking talking about how we need someone until Talbot comes back and then we can when Talbot comes back we can send Sogard down however we might also just trade Talbot at the, at the deadline if we can get a decent asset for him because he's better than most of the other goalies that are available uh, at the deadline. So maybe a guy like Stolarz could be of some use to uh, to keep around for the rest of the season if we move on from Talbot as well. Then maybe you have Stolarz and Sogard, something like that, or like Nedeljkovic or any of these other guys. And then it's also Anton Hudobin decided to throw his name on there because the stars have been looking to get rid of him for quite a while and looking at cap friendly I noticed that they have four goalies on AHL contracts and I have to assume that they don't want this really old goalie uh taking up any, any more games played down there they want to get their their younger guys playing I'm sure I, but if you get Kudobin I think you need to get an asset back with him like I think Dallas would have to uh, include like a late round pick or something to dump the last little bit of his deal because even though we need a warm body in goal right now, Gudobin has just like completely fallen off uh, in the NHL. Like not, he didn't even get any games this year. He got completely passed uh, for the backup role in Dallas. So that's not an option I would really like to see, but I put that on there just because I think it is an option. I think like... The Stars might even trade him for like future considerations. I wouldn't be surprised if we need a goalie that badly and we don't go with Martin. I could see that being a scenario where we just totally uh, trade trade nothing for a guy who's worth nothing with the, the old future considerations. But yeah, those are a few goalies that I think the Senators might be looking at. And then I also have a second graphic here with a list of goalies that I think the Sens might be looking at for next season, compared to those other guys who would be more of a stopgap situation for just the end of this season. I, I, I'm really interested by Carolina's goalie situation because they have Kuchetkov in the minors right now, but when Frederick Anderson was injured and Kuchetkov was up with the big club, he played better 
than Ranta has all season, and he played better than Frederick Anderson has all season. And they were just forced to send him down because of contracts, right? The whole one-way and two-way thing. But I'm sure uh, Carolina management is going to want to have Kochekov on the starting roster next year because he was just great. Both of Ranta and Frederick Anderson are UFAs. And they've both been kind of disappointing uh, despite being on a good team this season. So it, I, if I had to guess, I would think they'll be retaining at least one of them and play them with Kochetkov as the tandem next season. But I don't know. I don't know who it would be because Frederick Anderson has been the better goalie than Ranta for his whole career. However, he has been a little bit disappointing as their starter this season, despite being great this year and he's always injured so they might want to they might want to cut bait with him and just try to get a more durable goalie or you know just an upgrade in general through uh through free agency like i could see frederick anderson or anti ranta being decent to ufa goalie options uh if one or both of them are available i could see the sends making a run at either one of those guys because i definitely think kochetkov is going to be moving up for the hurricanes uh, and then I was also looking at Mackenzie Blackwood. He's a bit of a reclamation project as well because his stats have fallen in recent years. His last two seasons, or sorry, his first two seasons, a combined 70 games played, he had 916 save percentage, which is amazing for a rookie in his, uh, for a rookie and his sophomore season, just absolutely outstanding. And then he had a lot of struggles since then, a lot of injuries too. But Vitek Vanacek has just beaten him for the starting role this season. And then the Devils also have Akira Schmid, who they might want to have him as the backup role next season because he's been good uh, in his call-ups this year. So with uh, an expiring contract for Blackwood uh, as an RFA as well, you would have to pay an asset to acquire him. I don't think they would let him go for free, uh, you know, without giving the qualifying offer. I'm sure uh, goal goalies are valuable enough that they will at least tender him and uh, try to get an asset. I could see Blackwood being on the move, though, and I think that could be an interesting option for the Sens as well. And lastly, Yunus Corpusalo, also a bit of a, not quite a reclamation project because he's actually doing very well this year on a horrible team. A 909 save percentage on the worst team in the league is very impressive. It's almost a reclamation project because the previous season 877 save percentage that's just almost as bad as spencer martin this year so it's been an up and down career for corpus Allo where he's had like two really good seasons being this one and a few years ago uh which was the covid bubble year with the bubble playoffs and he had that uh, amazing game against tampa bay where it was like five ot's and he had like 80 saves or something like that so we know Corpus Allo can be good, but it's just, can he consistently be good is the question. And I'm thinking that the Blue Jackets are going to be looking to move him at the deadline, capitalize on uh, a bit of increased trade value from someone that they probably didn't expect to have very much. So I could see him getting moved to a contender at the deadline. Although if no contenders are interested, maybe Dorian just tries to pick him up. If not at the deadline, um, I think it's another guy that they'll look at in UFA. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, I felt like talking about goalies today because with that, that rough Forsberg injury, oh yes, the, the classic sends coming up again. I need to get on top of that and make sure it doesn't freaking pop up every single time I switch back to the main camera. But, but yeah, just wanted to talk about goalies today because I definitely think we're going to be picking someone up. I wouldn't be surprised to see Spencer Martin claimed on waivers tomorrow. But uh, we'll have to wait a little while to see what's up with that. And uh, lastly, if anyone's still hanging around in chat, I wanted to talk a little bit about Jacob Chikrin because he's been scratched for a couple games now, still hasn't been traded. It seems at this point that he was supposed to be traded to the Kings. And I, I wouldn't say that I'm still holding out hope that maybe the Sens could get him, but uh, I I'd be interested to see from any of you guys in chat if you are still wanting Chikrin or if you're you're fine with not getting him because at this point it seems like the Sens are out on him and I'm wondering I kind of want to gauge the fan base's opinion on that because we've been linked to him for so long like even last season it was like last season that he started being rumored to be available in trades 
and definitely since this summer, this previous summer, that uh, the Sens had specifically been linked to him. So this whole saga is hopefully coming to an end soon. Uh, we, we thought it would happen on the weekend, but it didn't. He's, he's still an Arizona Coyote for some reason. Um, I've been on the chicken train pretty much all season. The thing for me is, though, that Bruce Garriott reported that Coyotes were likely looking for two first-round picks as well as Ridley Gregg included in the deal. And I don't know if I would do that. If, if they wouldn't budge past that, I'm not sure if I would give up that value. Like, I really just don't want to give up Ridley Gregg at this point. I, I don't have much of a problem with giving up our first round picks because um, I don't think we're going to fall far enough in the draft lottery this year to be to have like a serious uh, chance at picking top five. Um, so I wouldn't be opposed to moving this year's first and you could even maybe top five protect it and just say, OK, if it's if it's a pick between six and ten, I'm perfectly fine with giving that up for Chikrin. Um, maybe it might be tough on top of next year's first two. Uh, that's the thing though, because Greg and two firsts is basically three firsts, and you know that this year's first is going to be top ten, maybe top fifteen. So it, it's tough. Like I, if we're again, if we're picking the six to fifteen range, I'm totally fine with trading that because we're trying to improve now. Like. I don't, if we get a top five pick, obviously we'll get a guy who can step in a couple of years from now, like one or two years and just be good right away. Uh, but if we're picking a little bit later in the draft or later in the first round, but not quite into the playoff range, um, we're probably going to be picking a guy who's three, four years away. And obviously you want to have prospect depth at all times and you can eventually just, you can eventually trade those prospects for, for someone later. Um, I just feel like the picks, usually the a pick in the top 15 is more valuable than the player that you pick there will be like a year or two later unless you get lucky and, and their stock rises with like a lot after the draft so ah uh, if, if there's any way to get chicken without giving up greg i would do it but but i don't know if you have to give up greg and you have to give up two first as well i think i'm fine with not getting him but Really curious to see what other people think here in the chat. Hamza says they would be fine with the two picks, but neither of Grieg or Pinto. And I pretty much agree with that. Because the, the main thing is the Sens need cheap contributors in the bottom six who can actually score. Like compared to the, these guys that we have in our bottom six right now who do not put up any points, do not generate any offense, do not even generate any freaking shot attempts or scoring chances. And it's just complete uh, net zero or net negative when they're out there on the ice. We need cheap contracts like Greg still on his entry level and Pinto who we should be able to sign to a cheap extension. We need guys like that for scoring depth. So and, and we already know they can play in this league compared to any any other prospects who haven't made it yet. So I agree that I really don't want to move either of those guys, but I don't have much of an issue with moving the picks. Because the thing is, like, I've already talked about moving this year's first, but if you move next year's first as well, put it, sure, put protection on it, but if we're bad enough that we're a lottery pick team again next year, like, at that point, just fold the freaking franchise. Like, if you acquired Chikrin, and, like, most of this team stays the same, like, you keep Dubrinkit as well, and, and get a decent uh, goaltender to play along with Forsberg, or, like, even re-sign Talbot, and then we're in the lottery range again next season, like, at some point, you just gotta go for it, because, like, at that point, we're just screwed. At that point, we're never going to be good if we add chicken to this team and we can't improve to get out of the lottery pick range like i would just trade the pick because uh we we need that defensive upgrade but but again if it totally hinges on greg and pinto i can see why dorian wouldn't want to do it um mr the new guy says we're gonna need a top six winger in a couple years when Giroud takes a step back that is a fair point as well if you if you consider Giroux will be on the, the decline for the next two years and then after that you have to replace him the th the thing about that for me is he's already making six million or whatever so you could replace him through free agency you could probably get a pretty solid player um and we'll continue to draft and develop other prospects uh even if we even if we were to trade those firsts 
Um, we still we still have some guys coming up. I wouldn't like if we keep our pick this year. I feel like uh, we probably should draft a forward to uh, to look for eventually replacing Giroud or something like that. I agree about that, but I feel like the defensive need in the present term is so pressing that it's just we need that more than we need to draft someone who will eventually re replace Giroud down the road. Although I do agree that that is something that we will have to look at and, and focus on in the future. Um, Hamza also said, I'd rather they trade... 2024 and 2025 first just because we need more top end prospects that's fair as well to not want to trade this year's first and just trade the next two i would i would mostly agree with that i just think that arizona would be really enticed by the kind of almost guaranteed value of a of a top 15 pick this season as opposed to us potentially improving in the next two seasons although that would obviously make sense from our perspective to go for those later picks instead but but yeah i i wish we could get chicken doesn't seem like it's going to happen at this point we're still waiting on a potential trade to the kings although with the trade being stalled i do wonder if maybe dorian will circle back i really hope that he will but it'll be tough because it seems that the coyotes had already gotten an offer from the kings uh that they liked that they were ready to accept so you would have to come back as dorian and then offer more maybe maybe you could come back with the same offer and be if the king's offer is not going to happen whatsoever maybe dorian had like the second best offer or something like that but but who knows i feel like i, I just want to see the trade go through to the kings at this point because i want to see what they gave up and I want to judge it for if I think the Sens should have beat the offer or not. Um, just because there uh, there were rumors that maybe Brant Clark would be included in the trade. Uh, maybe Byfield, but it sounds like that probably isn't going to happen. There's a lot of conflicting reports. So I feel like if the Kings aren't giving up either of their top two prospects, like it might end up being a trade package where I look at it and I'm going to feel like, oh my god, we could have beat that or we could have offered something very similar and you you have to wonder whether or not dorian did so i just hope we get closure on the chicken situation soon i i really don't think he's going to be a sen but i just want to see it go through so that uh we're not uh waiting forever um one last thing hamza asking what are my thoughts on sites have likely moving by the deadline I'm pretty excited by that just because I want to see his contract finally off the books. I am a little bit worried about what asset we'll have to give up to move his contract. Um, I don't really think it'll be more than a second, but the thing is, when you think about the original CC, Zaitsev, and Connor Brown trade, we got Zaitsev and Connor Brown for CC and whatever it was. Then we trade Connor Brown for a second, and then you're going to trade Zaitsev and a second to get rid of Zaitsev and get nothing back. So basically, we just wasted like four years with that trade doing nothing. We just, just four years of Zaitsev and three years of Connor Brown, and you end up with no assets at the end of it. So that feels a little bit shitty in the end, but I do want to see Zaitsev finally moved. Just, uh, he's been decent this year since he came back from Belleville, but I'm just, we're all ready to move on. So. I'm, I'm fine with this happening at the deadline, potentially, compared to waiting until the offseason. Obviously, depending on what we give up, of course. Again, if it's a second-round pick, I don't think that's great. But that's what it would have to be anyway. That's what I expected the price would have been if we were able to move him uh, before this season in the summer. So, I, I think it's going to happen. They were talking about it being a West Coast team. Then I was kind of wondering, like, oh, could he be included in the Chikrin deal, because Arizona's basically West Coast, close enough, but uh, likely not happening. I'm thinking probably Anaheim or maybe San Jose. Uh, those are the type of teams that just need need a need a guy to play play right D for them. I think Anaheim is the most li likely because um, John Klingberg is on that one year deal. I'm sure they'll be trading him at the deadline at like 50% retained. Then they need just someone to play right defense for them. And I think, I could be wrong, but Kevin Shattenkirk might also be a UFA, so maybe they even end up moving both of them. I think Anaheim is going to be the most likely, likely destination just because of that. I think they'll be moving out some other 
right defenseman, and then bring in Zaitsev. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Uh, gonna wrap it up there. What a what a crazy crazy night for the Sands. It just a night that was mostly boring and crap, and then ended up in jubilation at the end. Just uh, I can't wait to go back and watch the highlights of that comeback because it's just it was just awesome. That's that's what we like to see. That's what we we live for as hockey fans. It's just those awesome, awesome moments where you, it's just you can't you can't ex you gotta un expect the unexpected in this sport. You know, uh, I I kind of butchered that that saying, but that I think that's my cue to log off for the night. Uh, thank you everyone so much for watching. I will be back tomorrow to cover the Islanders game. I will have uh, Adam from the Zubcast uh, as my guest, so that should be. A great show tomorrow too. Thank you everyone for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe to STPN, and have a good night. Game over! Powered by Sports Interaction, Canada Sportsbook.